Great. So welcome to UGBS 614 Marketing Management. Today is our fifth lecture, and in today's lecture, we will be looking at market segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Now, this is one of the most fun and key aspects of marketing that we usually learn because it helps us to appreciate how the market is different and how we as marketers can be able to appreciate these differences and use them to our benefit. So like all our other sessions, there are certain learning outcomes we hope to have achieved by the time this session is through. And today they are four. The first one is to be able to understand how a company divides the consumer market into segments. And then the second one will be to be able to understand how business markets should be segmented. Now here we are making the distinction between consumer markets and business markets because when we talk about consumer markets, we are dealing with individuals and the decisions that they make when it comes to purchasing various products and services. Now, as we all know, business markets are made up of businesses or organizations. And in comparison with individual consumers, the processes that they go through when it comes to the manner in which they decide which products and services to purchase and how to go about purchasing them significantly differ. Hence, in addition to looking at how marketers of a company can divide consumer markets into segments, we will also try to understand how business markets should be segmented, taking into consideration all these differences that I have talked about between the two types of markets. Additionally, we would also want to be able to explain how a company can choose the most attractive target markets. And then finally, we will be able to understand the process of crafting firm positioning. So these are the four main learning outcomes we hope to have achieved by the time this session is through. So we begin by identifying market segments and targets. Now, why must we identify market segments and targets? We all know that firms generally in their operations always deal with a limited amount of resources. So that means that for the firm to be able to effectively achieve its objectives, these resources have to be equitably allocated to the various functional areas of the organization. Now, when it comes to marketing, depending on the product and services that the firm sells or deals in, it is largely known that there is a limited amount of resources that they usually have to allocate to the function of marketing and all the processes involved in designing, producing, pricing, promoting, and delivering these products and services to the final consumer. Now, we know that the firm has an unlimited number of customers that they can target with these product and service offerings, given that there is an excess of about 3 billion people all over the world who are potential customers for any product or service that the, the firm has to offer. However, like we mentioned, these resources are limited. And therefore, the firm cannot be able to target all these large, broad, and diverse customer markets who are all possible consumers for their product or service. And therefore, it is important for the firm to be able to pick and choose out of these broad and diverse markets, which of them they can effectively serve within the resource allocations that they have to be able to ensure that their objectives as a firm are effectively and efficiently achieved. Now, to be able to do this act of selecting specific markets or market segments to be able to serve within the resource allocation that the firm has requires a keen understanding of the behavior of the consumers within these markets, as well as careful strategic thinking given that the firm, because of their resource endowments, will not be able to efficiently and effectively target and serve all these diverse customer groups that we have, and they are diverse and unique characteristics. And therefore, it is very important for the firm to strategically understand which segments, based on the unique and different characteristics that they possess, 
can best be served within the firm's resource endowments so that they can be able to target these market segments and then satisfy them with uniquely designed products and services. In that regard, when we talk about the process of identifying market segments and targeting them, the firm has to make sure that they do that in an effective and efficient manner. And to ensure that this is done in an effective and efficient manner, it involves three main stages. The first stage being to be able to identify and profile the distinct groups of buyers or customers within these markets that they have who differ in terms of their needs and wants. And undertaking this process is what we refer to as market segmentation. Now, once market segmentation is complete, given that we appreciate the firm does not have unlimited resources to expend on their marketing function, the firm has to now go ahead and select one or more of these market segments, depending on their strengths and their resource endowments that they wish to serve. And this process is what we refer to as market targeting. Now, beyond the targeting, once they are able to identify the markets that they want to serve, they now have to go into each target segment and establish, communicate, and deliver the right benefits that they believe this segment needs and wants. And they have to make sure that these benefits they are delivering are communicated in a manner that it's able to stand out against other competing firms who are offering the same or similar benefits to the same target segment. And in doing this, the firm is engaging in what we refer to as market positioning. So essentially throughout today's lecture, we will be looking at the processes of market segmentation, market targeting, as well as market positioning, which collectively are referred to as the STP process which begins with the process of segmentation as we have identified, and then continues into targeting where the firm chooses one or more market segments to target with their offering. And then continues on to positioning, where the firm positions its product and service offering against that of other competing firms in the same category. Hence the acronym STP, representing segmentation, targeting and positioning in that order. Please, I hope we all understand. Yes, please. Good. So let's begin by looking at the first element of the STP process being segmentation. So when we talk about market segmentation, it involves dividing the market into well-defined slices. Now you see that slices here have been put into inverted commas because we are using it to metaphorically refer to how we go about slicing a cake into different pieces. You realize that we slice a cake into different pieces because the whole cake is too big for us to consume at the same time, isn't it? Right. Good. So yeah. we usually slice it into pieces so that we can have sizes or portions that are big enough for us to be able to manage to consume. And that is essentially what market segmentation is about. It's about dividing the market into these pieces or portions so that the firm can be able to pick a portion that they can effectively and efficiently manage to serve within their means. So a market segment in this regard would usually be one of these slices which consists of a group of customers who share similar sets of needs and wants, right? And in other terms, we would usually say that they have homogeneous characteristics, particularly in terms of their wants and their needs. So you realize that when you have a particular market segment, you can see that in terms of certain criteria, they have similarities. And we will get into these criteria very soon and how we base our division of the market into these slices on each of these criteria and combinations of these criteria where necessary. So once the firm is able to do this slicing up of the market into the segments, their main task is to identify the appropriate number and nature of market segments that they can 
serve efficiently and effectively. And you will notice I keep using the word efficiently and effectively because any market that is not worth serving efficiently and effectively is not worth focusing on. Because if the firm cannot serve them in an efficient and effective manner, there is no way the firm will be able to achieve their stated objectives in serving that market. So it is important for the firm to identify the number of markets, being that the firm can decide to just choose one or choose two or choose more than two, depending on their resource endowments and the, the way they, they believe they are positioned in terms of how best they can serve such a market. Again, they also need to look at the nature of the market segment because the composition of the market segment and the kind of consumers in that market segment must be considered in relation to the characteristics of the firm and their resource endowments to be able to clearly determine whether or not the firm can serve such a market efficiently and effectively. So in doing this, the firm can be able to decide which one or more of these segments that they can effectively and efficiently target with their product or service offer. Now with that understanding, why is it important for the firm to divide the market into these slices or segments that we have talked about? Apart from the fact that we've established just like a cake, it will be too big for the firm to consume it all at a go and will therefore have to break it down into slices to get manageable portions to consume. Market segmentation also helps the firm to identify different market segments for targeting. Because without dividing the market into these segments, which would usually possess certain homogeneous characteristics and unique differences, that will help you to be able to know which ones are approachable and which ones are not, the firm will not be able to know which segments they can effectively target and serve with their product and service offering, given their resource endowments. Again, we talked about the fact that resources are not unlimited. And therefore, firms usually have a limited amount of resources that they dedicate to various functional areas, including marketing. So by effectively segmenting the market and selecting particular segments to target, the firm can be able to equitably allocate their marketing budget towards serving each of these markets based on their unique needs to ensure that the firm's stated objectives are achieved. And by doing this equitable resource allocation based on the selected segments that the firm has identified that they can be able to, to serve, efficiently and effectively, it will definitely lead to effective marketing, given that the firm has taken the necessary steps to ensure that this is a market whose needs they can effectively satisfy and they have the necessary resource endowment to be able to effectively do so. And ultimately, market segmentation also helps to reveal hidden market opportunities. Because you will agree with me that usually when we get a cake as a whole, all we see is the outside of the cake and the elaborate or ornate decor that has been put around the cake, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Good. But to be able to see the layers within the cake and the flavor of the cake, we need to cut it open and get a slice out to taste, isn't it? Yep. Good. It's the same with market segmentation. We have to be able to slice up the cake to be able to taste it, to see what is in there, to see if we like it or not, to see if it will be good for us or not before we go ahead and invest our resources into it. So just like the cake metaphor, when it comes to the market, by dividing it into these different groups, we can be able to see unique characteristics of various customers within these market segments. And that will help us to be able to effectively identify certain opportunities that we can pursue among these customer segments in a profitable manner, which we may not have been able to do if we were taking the whole market as a cake without breaking it down into these slices, as we metaphorically refer to them, or market segments. So these are the four main importance of market segmentation and why firms cannot avoid it if they want to be able to effectively and efficiently serve the market 
to achieve their objectives of earning profit. So now that we understand the importance of market segmentation, let's look at the different bases for segmenting consumer markets. Remember we talked about the fact that in terms of segmenting the market, we're going to distinguish between consumer markets and business markets. This is someone saying something. Okay. So in the beginning, we talked about the fact that in terms of segmentation, we are going to distinguish between consumer markets and business markets, given that the nature of the buyers in these two markets are significantly different, especially when it comes to the manner in which they decide which product or service to purchase and consume and how they go about the purchase process. So we will begin by looking at the basis for segmenting consumer markets, which has individual consumers solely making the decision to purchase a particular product or service and taking the initiative to purchase the product or service in question. Now, in this regard, there are four main bases we use to segment the market. The first one is demographic. The second one is psychographic. The third one is behavioral. And the fourth one is geographic. So when a firm is segmenting the market, they could use demographic segmentation basis psychographic segmentation basis, geographic segmentation basis, or behavioral segmentation basis. Now, if the firm wants to become a bit more complex and technical and develop a unique niche for themselves in the market, which will enhance their chances at differentiating themselves from the competition and occupying a unique position in the minds of consumers, they could go ahead and combine some of these segmentation bases to be able to segment the market into even more finer segments or slices, if you may, that will give them more of a leg up in terms of advantage over their competition. So you would notice that some firms would use a combination of demographic and psychographic segmentation or demographic and geographic segmentation or any combination of the others, perhaps two or three different bases to be able to come up with a unique niche that they can set and I believe we remember the concept of seven niche markets from our previous session when we were discussing dealing with the competition. We remember, don't we? Yes, please. Yes, we do. Good. All right. So in that regard, let's look at each of these segmentation bases and what they entail, starting from the most common segmentation basis, which is geographic segmentation. Now, this is where the market is divided into geographic units. So based on geography, we know the markets can be segmented along the lines of nations, states, regions, counties. If you want to go into more detail, you could use specific zip codes or neighborhoods or specific addresses, right? All of these fall under geographic segmentation. Now, a firm can decide to operate in one or two or perhaps a few more of these geographic units, depending on their objectives as a firm and their strategic direction. So you will notice that some firms do not operate outside of certain geographic locations, isn't it? Yes, please. Good, right? And that is a direct result of geographic segmentation based on their strategic direction as a firm, they may have decided that outside of these geographic regions, we do not desire our operations to be, to be consumed by any buyer, right? So when it comes to geographic segmentation, the firm can decide to either do it along the lines of specific cities or specific countries, which is the most common, or look at specific areas based on population density or do it within a specific radius. Some would do it in the radius of regions, right? Or, or specific continents. So you realize that some firms operate only in Asia and they don't operate outside Asia. Some firms operate in specific countries like the United States or in the UK and they do not operate outside of that, that region. In terms of geography too, some firms may decide to segment based on climate. So they only sell to people within a particular climatic region. And for others, it would be as basic as serving 
either an urban community or a rural community. So in Ghana, for instance, there are certain services we will find in urban areas that we do not find in rural areas. Please, are we aware? Yes, Doc. Yes. Good. Right. So these are all geographic segmentation bases. Good. Now, aside geographic segmentation bases, we can also talk about demographic segmentation. Now, demographic segmentation here is where the market is divided based on the size, the structure, and development within the population. So this has to do largely with the people. So when we talk about the size, structure, and development within the population, we are talking about the size in terms of numbers, the structure in terms of how the population is structured, perhaps based on age, based on gender, based on income, based on education, and then other developments in terms of how these various structures we have talked about are evolving over time. So you would realize that some countries that previously had perhaps a certain structure of age distribution will perhaps currently or in a few years time have developments in that area such that the age structure would have shifted. I'm sure some years back, Japan did not have an aging population. But now, based on development in the population, the structure of the age distribution in that country is such that most people fall within the aged category. So when we talk about demographic segmentation, these are the things that we look at. And you'll bear with me that demographic, in addition to geographic, are two of the most common segmentation bases we use, with some of the most common demographic segmentation bases being gender, age, income, and education. As we all feature most of these in our questionnaires and interview guides for data collection. Right? And the reason why demographics are very popular, just like geographics, is that they are often directly associated with consumer needs and wants. Meaning that by looking at a specific demographic criterion, you can be able to directly tell the needs of that particular consumer group within the population. So for instance, if I decide to pick religion and I mention Muslims, you can directly tell me the needs and wants that such a person would have, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Yes. So a yes, typical please. example of a need or wants that a, a person who belongs to the Muslim or Islamic religion would, would have. Anyone, very quickly, so we can proceed. Jalabia. Yes, Nanama. Their clothing, the hijab. Good. Right? So if you are a firm that deals in such clothing, this particular segment of the market, based on their demography, is who you will target. Very good, Nanama Bwati. Any other one? Yes, Priscilla. The Holy Quran. Okay, so that means that whatever you are selling to them should not contradict what is taught to, to them in terms of the, the teachings of the Holy Quran, isn't it? Great. So a typical example of that will be the halal, isn't it? Because the halal is contained in the Holy Quran. Am I right? Yes. Good. Yes, please. All right. So that is a typical example of how demography can influence your decisions as a marketer, right? And another reason why demography is popular be is because it is easy to measure. It's very easy to tell which religion a person is. You can basically look at certain few characteristics of theirs and tell immediate, almost immediately what religion they are. You can look at a person and immediately tell what gender they are. Perhaps age may not be as obvious because these days, there are a lot of people who claim to be aging in reverse. Some people are off and, and their mothers work together and their mothers are often mistaken for their sisters, isn't it? Has anyone experienced that before? Yes, please. <laughs> 
Yeah, oh, I mentioned the ladies, the men too. Sometimes you're working with your dad and they think he is your brother, right? Because oh, you notice goodness. that a lot of the older people are now taking better care of themselves. So they do not tend to age very, very fast, right? So when it comes to age, someone may say, okay, you can't immediately look at someone and tell how old they are. However, generally, it is one of the more obvious characteristics about a person, just like the agenda, right? Good. So the ease of measurement is another reason why demographic segmentation criteria are common. Now, like I mentioned, when we talk about demographic segmentation criteria, we can talk about age and life cycle stage. Now we combine age and life cycle stage because like I mentioned, age in itself is a controversial criterion to use. And to use it on its own may sometimes lead to some inaccuracies, especially when it comes to marketing decisions. Given the concept of life cycle stage, because people of different age groups find themselves at different stages of their life cycle. Right? So when you look at the person's age and their life cycle, you need to be able to determine what they may need. Now, age again in conjunction with life stage is another whole matter. Because where age can clearly tell you the person's life cycle stage that they are in, it may not necessarily tell you the life stage that they are in, as we will find out very soon. However, when it comes to other variables like gender and income, and generational groups, which somewhat rely on age, they are easier to delineate, and we will find out very soon. So let's first look at age and life cycle stage, as well as age and life stage, and why we are making this distinction. So when we talk about age and life cycle stage, we know that depending on how old a person is, their wants and abilities change, isn't it? So usually when you are younger, very young, you are deemed to be a bit more energetic. However, when you are growing old, you are deemed to, becoming, to be becoming weaker than you were in your more youthful age or the more youthful stages of your life, right? So this can be directly related to the human life cycle, which has six main stages. So generally when you are a fetus and when you are a baby, your wants and your abilities are totally different from when you become a child. And they continue to change through adolescence and through adulthood and through when you become an elderly person. And all of these factor into the decisions of the marketer when they are crafting a product or service to sell. Because you will notice that most of the products or services that are sold usually target consumers of a particular age group at a particular life cycle stage. True or false? True. Mm. Good. So for instance, when we talk about toothpaste, generally, brands like Crest and Colgate and Pepsodent, you would notice, usually offer different product lines. And for Crest and Colgate specifically, they usually have three lines. One targeting kids, the other targeting adults, and the other targeting older consumers. Because you would notice, for instance, with some of the brands like Colgate and Wisdom Toothpaste, that when they are targeting kids, at certain ages, they would look at how the child's teeth will be developing and formulate the toothpaste for that particular purpose. And then as the child gets older into the toddler and kid stages, they would want to formulate it such that it helps to fight plaque and decay, given the increased consumption of sweets and sugar at that age. Please, am I making sense? Yes. Good. Then when it comes to toothpaste that targets adults and the old elderly consumers, it's all about helping them to fight all these different tooth diseases, teeth whitening, and then maintaining the health of the teeth into the long term. Right? So this is a typical example of how a particular firm can decide to segment the market based on age and life cycle. And you will notice that other service and product categories particularly target certain kinds of consumers at certain stages of the life cycle. For instance, let's take a service firm like Transitions Ghana. What life cycle stage 
That's Transitions Ghana Target Consumers Act. Transitions, yeah. What age? What age, Priscilla? Maybe at their very old age. Elderly, yeah. They'll they yeah, target the elderly. From where? From where? Someone said something. Was it Ahmed? Yes, please. I was saying over 60. Over 60, yes. But have you noticed that they have slightly changed their strategy? They now also target adults. Yes. Yeah. So those in their 30s and 40s. Why do you think that is? They do. Yes. Why do you think that is? Anyone with a reason? Maybe the adults are the one paying for their old for the old people. Good, right? And that is a direct result of life stage. So let's quickly talk about life stage and then I'll come back. So life stage defines a person's major concern at a point in their lives, such as for instance, going through a divorce going into a marriage, taking care of an older parent, buying a new home, and so on. So you would realize that basing specifically on age and life cycle, transitions would usually target the elderly who are 60 plus or 50 plus, who we presume might need their services and they want to be able to prepare for it. However, now we've identified they also target adults who are not exactly in the stage of life where we believe they might need it so much as the elderly, but because of the life stage that they may find themselves in, particularly where they are taking care of their older parents, they may need it and may want to pay for it to prepare for the transition of that older parent. Please, do we understand? Yes. Good. So this is what I was talking about in terms of the fact that picking age and life cycle alone may not help a marketer to effectively segment the market. Given that the age and the life cycle alone is not a strong enough predictor of the specific needs that the customer might have. So it will help to combine the age and the life cycle with the life stage that the person is in. And that will help the marketer, marketer, sorry, to make a more targeted selection of which segment to be able to sell. So you will notice that when it comes to the ability to purchase a home, again, we can see that marketers or firms who deal in the sale of lands and houses are no longer just targeting elderly people who they believe will have the financial um, gravitas to be able to make these purchases but they also target adults and young adults, isn't it? Yes, please. Good, because they believe that at the stage of life that they are in, they may be wanting to settle down and therefore buy their own home or buy a piece of land and then in, in future be able to build their own home, right? So in essence, what are we saying? We're saying it is important to combine age and life cycle with life stage for effective segmentation because people in the same part of the life cycle may have different life stages that they are going through. And this will influence their needs and wants. And therefore for the firm to be able to effectively identify unique opportunities for their marketers to pursue, they have to be able to use this combination of demographic variables to be able to ensure that they are effectively and efficiently segmenting the market into groups that they can have unique opportunities to serve for the purposes of earning good profits. So moving on, we can also talk about gender. Oh. <laughs> Amen. You didn't want us to talk about gender, eh? Amen. Oh, dog. dog. <laughs> it's so, so basic. Let's talk eh? about it. Yeah. But let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about it. Okay. So let's not spend time on it. Basically, I think what Ahmed said has said, 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 said it all. 
men and women are different based on physiology, based on genetics, based on attitudes. They are known to, to be very different in terms of how they approach the purchase and consumption of various products and services. And therefore, as marketers, we need to be able to look at these differences and know how to be able to target the male and female gender when it comes to the specific um, segmentation of the market based on the products and services that we offer. And you will notice that in terms of specific products and service categories, when it comes to decision making, depending on whether the male or female you are dealing with is single or married, the decision making often falls with one gender in one way or the other, depending on the product or service and the role that each of this gender plays, assuming they are in a marriage or they are in some kind of contractual relationship or they are single. So you would notice that in certain households where there is a husband and wife, certain decisions depending on the amount of financial outlay involved can be independently made by the, the, the wife in the home or independently made by the husband. However, when it comes to certain financial decisions, depending on how big they are, the decision has to be made jointly by both the male and the female. So these are just a few of the issues that could come up when you're dealing with either gender in terms of marketing. And marketers have to consider this when they are putting their products and services out there. Again, we can talk about income, which is another very common one. And this has been a long-standing practice in various categories of products and services, including automobiles, clothing, cosmetics, financial services, including insurance, as well as travel, right? So you will notice that in the automobile industry, when you're buying a car, the general classification they do based on income is they either offer you the full option or the standard option, isn't it? Yes, please. Good. And then in addition to that, depending on your income and, and how well you can pay, they will either give you a payment plan or they would insist on getting cash outright or getting the full payment outright. I know that currently a lot of automobile companies have standing agreements with various institutions because of the nature of the income of the employees of those institutions to be able to offer them automobiles using flexible payment plans. Right? The same goes for financial services and travel. You will notice that based on how well a person can pay, they either have the option of when it comes to travel, going for an economy class ticket, a business class ticket, or a first class ticket, among others. Right? But it's important to note that income does not always predict the best customers for a given product. Because a person may be earning a certain level of income, but may want to consume a particular product or service that may be presumably, presumably sorry, outside of their income range. However, with creative marketing, we can be able to also target such consumers in these income groups to ensure that we can serve them, right? A typical example, for instance, is given where the color television was first introduced. And some of the first purchases were blue collar workers. Now, ideally, anyone would have thought that white collar workers would have been the ones to go in for these color television sets, given that they were in the higher income range and would be more um, eligible to purchase such a product. However, research showed that the blue collar workers, because of their income range, did not have enough disposable income to always be spending on watching movies and going to restaurants for these viewings and all that. So they saw purchasing a color television as a more resource, um, in a, a more plausible option that would save them money into the long term. Unlike the white collar workers who had the money and could therefore go ahead and without a television, go to the movies or go to restaurants where there would be these screens where they could watch these shows that they wanted to watch among others, right? But for a blue collar worker, it was about being able to save money and having the television in their home was the best alternative moving into the long term. So that is for income. Now beyond income, we can talk about generations. 
And generations here are a more evolved form of the age classification when it comes to segmenting the market. And this generational segmentation of the market has become more pronounced in the age of information communication technology, given that certain generational groups have been known to be more responsive to the use of information communication technology and hence the marketing of products and services that have a large component of information communication technology in them. So when we talk about generations, they are largely made up of individuals who are born within a particular time frame. So you would see that when we mention generational groups or generational cohorts, they fall within certain years. Now these years or periods within which they are born are usually marked by certain significant occurrences in terms of music, politics, and other defining events within those periods which influence the behavior and the outlooks of these individuals who are born within these periods, as well as the values that they possess. So you would notice that people would generally classify people born within the 80s and the 90s and the 70s and the 60s. These were the general decade-based generational cohorts that we had. However, in recent literature, we have sought more refined ways of classifying these generational groups and cohorts. And we do this by using a theory we refer to as the generational theory. Now, because the theory has been largely used and studied, you would notice that the classification of the birth dates, meaning the beginning years and ending years of the cohorts within which these generational groups fall, is very subjective, depending on the source that you are citing from, right? So for the purposes of this particular lecture, we will be using Gary Ketal 2017's classification, which he used in an article uh, published in Springer, sorry, more, very recently. And in his classification, he classifies six groups of generational cohorts, which virtually all the other authors have, starting from the most recent being the generation alpha, which are those people born from 2010 to present. And then we can talk about the iGen or the Gen Z, also referred to as Generation Z, being those born between 1995 and 2009. Then we can talk about the Millennials or the Generation Y, being those born between the years of 1980 and 1994. Then we have the Generation X, being those born between 1965 and 1979. And then the baby boomers, being those born between 1946 and 1964. And then ultimately, we can talk about the silent generation or the builders, who are those who were born between 1925 and 1945. Now, like I mentioned, of these six generational groups, one half is known to be born prior to the information communication technology boom. And another half is known to have been born with and grown in the age of technology such that when it comes to issues of technology, they are more sensitive and more responsive than that of the other three generational groups. So based on the explanation I just gave, which groups can we say are those who were born with and are living with information communication technology? Who's from the Mayim? Frank, you said? From the millennials up there. Okay, so please can you mention them? Millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. Good. Right, so these are the three main generations that were born with and grew up with technology. And the other three are those who were born back. So when it comes to the marketing of products and services, if any of these generational cohorts fall within the market or the segments that you are trying to target, you need to know how to go about formulating your marketing mix program, meaning how you go about designing your product, how you go about pricing it, how you go about promoting it, and how you go about delivering it. Because if you are targeting those born in the age of technology, then there should be a large technological component in how you go about pricing, promoting and delivering your product or service. 
However, if you are dealing with the other set of customers, you need to know that a large component of information communication technology may be a bit of a challenge for those generational groups, given that they may not be as technologically savvy as the other three groups, being the Gen Alphas, the Gen Zs, and the Millennials. So that is for the generational cohorts. And thank you very much, Frank, for that response. So with that, we've come to the end of the discussion on the demographic segmentation basis. Now let's move on to psychographic segmentation. And when we talk about psychographics, it's basically the science of using the psychology of people and their demographics, which we just talked about, to better understand them and their behavior, especially when it comes to their purchase and consumption of products and services. Now in this regard, psychographic segmentation divides buyers into groups on the basis of their psychological and personality traits, as well as their lifestyles and their values. Now one of the very popular and very well-known commercial classification systems that helps firms to psychographically segment the market is what we refer to as the VALS framework. And this was developed by a corporation referred to as Strategic Business Insights. Now this framework was designed using specific criteria in the form of a survey that consumers have to respond to. And depending on your responses to the questions in the survey, which is made up of four demographic questions and 35 attitudinal questions, it will classify you into a primary group which rates the customer and positions them based on their primary motivations. And from the model here, we can see that the primary motivations are in terms of the ideals of the person, their level of achievement and their level of self-expression. And this is juxtaposed against the resource endowment of this individual and the degree of innovation that they expect to see in the products and services that they consume. So you can see from the model that the primary motivation is juxtaposed against those who seek high innovation and have high resources, along with those who seek low innovation and low resources and all those in between. So by the end of the classification, based on your responses to the questionnaire or the survey, you are either classified as an innovator, a thinker, an achiever, an experiencer, a believer, a striver, a maker or a survivor. Now this is specifically for the United States of America. So it's crafted mainly for the US population. However, over the years, the developers of the framework have been able to fine tune it and customize it to suit various contexts. So as we are going to see very soon, I'm taking you to the website of Strategic Business Insights. We will notice that the firm is able to customize this VALS framework we have talked about and use it in other contexts other than the United States where they first started utilizing the framework. So this is the website of the organization. Please, can we all see it? Yes, please. Good. So as you can see, it says Strategic Business Insights, US Framework and VALS Types. So here, if you want to use the US framework, you can just click on VALS survey and it will quickly take you to the survey page and you can answer the questions and it will classify you based on your responses into one of these eight criteria that we just went through. However, like I said, as we can see, they have managed to customize it to suit other markets internationally. So on this page that is labeled international vows, you can see that they have been able to develop the vows framework for other markets apart from the US, including China, the Dominican Republic, Japan, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and Venezuela. Please can we see that? Yes, please. Good. Yeah, we can. So when we click on Nigeria, we can see that it opens up and shows us a whole new classification that they are using for the Nigerian market. Please, can we see that? So yes. in the Nigerian market, instead of using innovation and resources, 
you can see that they are comparing primary motivations being tradition, achievement, and self-expression against status. Can you see that? Yes. <laughs> and is anyone surprised by that? I don't think so. Oh, really? <laughs> Good, because Nigerians are all about status. And you will notice that they replaced ideals with tradition. Do you see that? Yes. Good. Right? So instead of ideals, they have tradition, and then they kept achievement and self-expression. And instead of innovation and resources, they replaced them with status. So depending on whether you are high status or low status and your primary motivation, you are either a traditional, you are either middle class, a quiet achiever, a big man cynic, have big man principles, a facilitator, a pace setter, you are either part of the masses or you are a striver. And you can see that here, instead of eight, they have nine classes. Do you see that? Yes, please. Yeah, instead of the eight. So like I mentioned, they customize it for specific markets depending on mm -hmm. your objectives as a firm and the nature of the buyers within those markets, right? And you will notice that if we look at those for the other countries as well, there will be significant differences. For instance, Looking at the vows for Japan, you can see that theirs also changes significantly. Mm -hmm. In theirs, we can see that yeah. innovation is back. And instead mm -hmm. of status, we can see power. Mm -hmm. Good. But they maintain tradition instead of ideals. So we can see that in the Japanese market, tradition is also a key part of, of, of the, the culture of the people or their nature. And you can see that they, instead of the nine that Nigeria had and the eight that the US had, have a total of how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They have ten classifications. Can we see that? Yes. Good. So when you get the opportunity, just go to the website and check it out. Because as you will see, all of the international markets have different classifications, right? This is that of China. And this is that of the Dominican Republic, very different. And this is that of Venezuela, very different what as about well. Ghana? And they've not done it for Ghana. It seems nobody has given them a business reason to do one for Ghana. Oh, so bad. Yeah, you know data collection costs money. So yeah. someone has to be willing to invest the resources for them to do the study. Okay. Good. Because right, it's a commercial firm, so they are in it to earn some profit for themselves. So we need someone to fund the study for them to undertake it. Right? So please, when you get the opportunity, just visit their website and go through. And if possible, you can take the survey yourself and see where they'll classify you. But because they have not done one specifically for our country, if you take one, for instance, if you take the US one, they'll be classifying you based on US ideals and criteria rather than unique criteria from your um, context being Ghana, right? So that is for the VALS framework. And that brings us to the end of the discussion on psychographic segmentation. Now, next, we can talk about behavioral segmentation, right? Now, behavioral segmentation is necessary because even though someone would argue that psychography determines a person's behavior, because we are essentially looking at how their personality traits determine their lifestyles and their values, which influence how they act. Behavioral segmentation is necessary because psychographic segmentation has often been accused of being a bit far removed from actual consumer behavior, right? Meaning that it does not categorically tell us exactly how consumers are behaving based on these values and lifestyles and personality traits classifications. So behavioral segmentation helps marketers to divide the market further on the basis of the knowledge of the customer base, their attitude towards specific products and services, and how they use and respond to these products and services. So in their mindsets, this is a more direct explanation or provides a more direct understanding of how consumers will behave in a practical situation 
when faced with a decision to purchase a particular product or service. So with that understanding, behavioral segmentation can be done on the basis of one, the needs and the benefits that the customer is looking for in the product or service. Two, the decision role that the customer occupies when it comes to the decision of whether to buy a product or service or not. And then three, the kind of user that they are and the usage related variables that we can identify when it comes to the manner in which this said consumer uses the particular product or service. So let's take each of these one after the other, starting from needs and benefits and dissect them. So with needs and benefits, you will agree with me that not everyone has the same needs or wants for a particular product. And whenever a person purchases a product or service, the benefits they get from it may be significantly different from those that another buyer would get from the same product or service. True or false? True, true. Good. So with that, we can say that people buy products and services for different reasons, seeking to satisfy different needs and get different benefits. And in this, a company called Constellation Brands came up with a particular segmentation of the market based on the different needs and benefits for which U.S. consumers would buy premium wine. Now, in their argument, people would usually buy a premium bottle of wine for different reasons and purposes in the U.S. And in their classification, when would they talk about a premium bottle of wine? It's any wine that costs $5.50 and about per bottle. So in their research, they found that there are six reasons or six different benefits that consumers seek in the US when they purchase a premium bottle of wine. The first one is the enthusiast, who usually seeks it because they are an enthusiast of wine. So they just love wine. And for them, they want to be able to consume it because they can afford it. And they want to be able to consume the best because they can afford the best. So these enthusiasts are usually the people who have an average income of about $76,000 a year. And they form 12% of the U.S. premium wine market. Now, a step below the enthusiasts are those we refer to as the image seekers. Right? And they usually skew male. And unlike the enthusiasts and the other segments we are going to discuss, that usually skew female, this is the only segment that is largely made up of males with an average age of 35. And here they are image seekers because they basically use the wine as a badge to show their status of who they are and that they are willing to pay more just to make sure that they are getting the right bottle of wine. So it's more of a status symbol for this group of people and they constitute 20% of the market. Next, they talk about a group that are referred to as savvy shoppers. And these are the people who love to shop and they believe they do not have to spend a lot of money to get a good bottle of wine. So for them, it's not about how much the, the bottle of wine costs, it's all about taste. So if they have to go into the bargain bin where they have cheaper wines, which cost less than $5, but taste good, they would go for those bottles of wine because it's all about the taste and they taste good. So it doesn't have to be expensive to taste good. And these are the savvy shoppers who constitute 15% of the market. Then they have the traditionalists who buy the bottle of wine unnecessarily because it is very expensive, but it's because the brand is one that they have heard of from wineries that have been around for a long time. So they are more into the tradition of drinking wine from old wineries that are known for producing good wine. So it's not necessarily about how expensive it is. And this group constitutes 16% of the market. And then the fifth group are the satisfied sippers. They do not know much about the wine that they are drinking. All they know is that it's wine and it tastes good. And they would usually stick to buying the same brand all the time because they are used to the taste of it. And they just want to go ahead and keep enjoying that taste. And they constitute 14% of the market. And then the final group being the overwhelmed group, 
who constitute 23% being the largest group, are the ones who see wine as something that they can purchase, but they do not even know where to start when it comes to purchasing wine because they don't know much about it. So when it comes to the wine purchasing situation, they are generally overwhelmed given the multiple options on the market. And this group is considered to be a very attractive target market because they are naive when it comes to the concept of wine drinking and wine purchases. And therefore, they are attractive to the market as such that there is huge room and opportunity to sell to them and convince them, especially coming from a particular brand, that their brand of wine is what they should be consuming, given that it will offer them the best benefits. And because they do not know much about the market, the marketer has an opportunity to be the first brand to position themselves in the mind of these groups of consumers. So based on this company's classification, they were able to break down the market into these segments and develop specific strategies to be able to target the specific consumers in these various segments. Now, given that they are a, a very premium wine company, you would notice that this segmentation showed them which groups to focus on, right? So just very quickly, Looking at the different segments we've, we've talked about, if you were this premium wine company, which groups would you target and why? The groups include the enthusiasts, the image seekers, the savvy shoppers, the traditionalists, the satisfied sippers, and the overwhelmed. If you were a premium wine company, which of these segments would you target and why? I think um, the set one. Yes, Stephen. Yeah. Well, because, okay. Yes, because if I'm not mistaken, they are the they can get you the volumes, mm -hmm. and it may not take um, a lot of a lot of effort to 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 get them to buy. So I mean, compared in in relation to the rest. Good so point. I think, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Very good point. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that contribution. That's a very good point. Please, anyone else? Priscilla, did you have something to add? Yes. Um, if I could see the previous slide. Yes. Please. I would go Here you for. Are. I would go for the enthusiast, and because you are selling a premium brand. Yeah. And yeah. premium, you have the tendency of increasing pricing, and these okay. people have an income that is high. Okay. And so okay. they would they would um, easily take out money from their pockets to purchase. Mm -hmm. And then also the image seekers, because they will buy to boost their image because it's yeah. a premium brand. People yeah. want to wear Nike, people want to wear Adidas, you mm -hmm. know, just because it's the premium. They want to yeah. use Ferrari. Yeah. But if you go and choose a person, the sixth person who is confused about, uh, about buying any wine brand, yeah. then it means that they will never be loyal to you. Yeah. So they will That's buy you the point. next time they will buy another brand. So you yeah. can never have a loyal um, consumer out of them. But yeah. the first and the second, they will be loyal to you. Even if you increase price, they will still stick to you, yeah. even if you are charging premium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent point, Priscilla. So you would notice that Priscilla's points and Stephen's points are all valid, though quite divergent. And that is because, let's take Priscilla and Stephen as two separate firms. You would notice that their objectives are totally different. Stephen is coming from the angle of getting the mass market and getting them to be able to buy more so that he can be able to earn more faster. And because they are overwhelmed and they don't know much, it will be easy to convince them. But Prisma is also coming from the angle of building a loyal customer base, meaning that she is choosing to focus on the enthusiasts and the image seekers so that she can have a loyal customer base and keep them into the long term. So you can see that it's just justifying what we have been saying from the beginning, that depending on the firm's objectives, the segments that they choose to target will differ. 
particularly also in relation to their resource endowments and how they want to go about allocating these resources to the marketing function. So thank you very much, Priscilla and Stephen. Those were excellent submissions. Great. So that brings us to the end of the discussion on the needs and benefits. Now, still on the issue of behavioral segmentation, looking particularly at decision rules. Here we are looking at the role that the particular person we are targeting, the particular consumer we are targeting, plays in the buying decision. Now, like I was trying to explain earlier, people play different roles when it comes to the decision on which products to buy. Now, in marketing, when it comes to the consumer market, we identify five main decision rules. Now, these decision rules will differ if we were considering the business market, right? However, with the consumer market, when we talk about decision rules, there are five main ones. The first one being the initiator who initiates the purchase process by identifying that there is a need that has to be satisfied. Then the influencer who ends up directly or indirectly influencing the particular brand or kind of product or service that ends up getting purchased to satisfy this need or want that has been identified. And then the decider being the one who makes the final decision of which brand of product or service to buy. And then the buyer being the one who engages in the actual act of making the purchase and then the user being the one who ends up consuming or using the product or service that has been purchased now you will realize that different people play different roles when it comes to the buying decision that like we have identified in each of these five rules i tried to make a distinction between the male and the female gender earlier in terms of decision rules given the scenarios of a single person deciding to make a purchase and a married couple deciding to make a purchase. And here we are going to rely on the married couple scenario again. So here we are saying, for instance, if a wife initiates a purchase by requesting for a treadmill to use in exercising for her birthday, she tells her husband that she wants a treadmill. So she should go and buy her a treadmill. Now, the husband who may not know much about treadmills will begin to look around and seek information on treadmills. And he would often consult people that he believes are experts when it comes to the purchase and use of treadmills. So he may likely consult perhaps a friend who recently bought one for his wife or a friend who recently bought one himself. Or just go to a shop where they sell sports equipment and ask them what their best brands are. So in this case, whoever he consults with during the process of seeking information and deciding which brand of treadmill to buy ends up becoming an influencer. With the initiator being who? Who would the initiator be? The wife. Good, so the wife is the initiator, right? Now, after he has consulted all these people, he now comes back and looks at all the information he has got and then ends up with a final option that he goes ahead to purchase. So in this case, the husband ends up becoming what? What role does the husband play? The influence. No. What role the does buyer. he play? The buyer. He's the buyer and at the same time, he's also the... Decider. 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 Right? Good. And once he decides and buys it, he brings it home and the wife will use it, but definitely it's a treadmill and it will be put in the home. So the wife alone will not use it. It will be utilized by the entire family, isn't it? Yes. Good. Yes, right? Now, when it comes to decision rules, like I mentioned, in consumer markets, there's these five rules that we have identified. However, in business markets, there's a slight difference where we have all these decision rules and one additional decision rule. Who can guess that additional rule? Who can guess that additional rule? It is sometimes 
ignored. But that role is a very key role that is often played by the most unlikely individuals. Who can guess? Who can guess that additional role that is not captured here? Who can guess? Anyone? The intermediary role. No. Very good attempt, but not the intermediary, Matilda. We are getting close. They influence the decision just like the intermediary. The marketer. Not the marketer. Think, think, think. Okay, let me give you some clues. This role is usually played by people like the security man, like the receptionist. <laughs> the the it begins oh, with the word killer. gate. It starts with the word gate. Gate. <laughs> gate what? Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper. Right? Very good. Gatekeeper. You all know the gatekeepers, right? They are very, very important when it comes to the purchase decision in business markets. Because you know that the business purchase process takes place in stages and phases. And a lot of these stages are controlled by specific gatekeepers. So, for instance, if you are the potential seller who wants to go and submit a tender you may have to go through a gatekeeper being either the receptionist or the security man who can decide whether or not your tender documents even get into the pool in the first place to be considered true or false very sure good right so that is why they are gatekeepers and their roles are very important particularly in business and markets when it comes to decision making regarding which products and services to purchase, right? So that is for decision rules. Next, we can talk about user and usage related variables still on the issue of behavioral segmentation. And here we are talking about the fact that many marketers believe the users of the product and service or their usage related variables are a good starting point for any marketer who wants to segment the market. Because depending on the nature of the user and how they use the product, you can be able to decide whether or not they are an attractive enough segment for you to focus your marketing efforts on. And in this regard, we can classify various usage related variables, including occasions. So you realize that people have needs for different products and services on different occasions. And these occasions are either marked by a particular time of the day, of the week, a particular time of the month, a particular time of the year, or certain temporal aspects of a consumer's life. So you realize that certain kinds of products are required annually during certain festivities, like Christmas time, like Valentine's, or as some people will call it chocolate day in certain countries, or as some people will call it heart day or heart month in certain countries. People have needs for different products and services at these different times, right? So we can distinguish the buyers according to the occasions when they will develop a need to purchase these products. There's a very popular company in the US called 1-800-Flowers and they have built their entire business model around these usage occasions, such that in their marketing, they have standing customers who have registered to have flowers and other gifts automatically sent to their loved ones during specific occasions. So Nana Mabuateng can register with 1-800-Flowers so that every year on Mother's Day, they will send her mother a hamper and flowers. And she just has to pay a subscription fee to that effect. So Nana Ma no longer has to worry about Mother's Day is coming. What do I get for my mom and all that? This is a typical example of how marketers can use occasions to secure their businesses. Please, I hope you understand. Yes, Good. Another example of these usage related variables is user status. And this is very important for marketers because it helps the marketer to know how to plan their promotions. Now, when it comes to user status, every product has its one non-users being people who have never used the product before. 
to X users being people who were using the product previously, but are no longer using it. And then potential users, meaning people who have the potential or have the ability and the probability of using the product, but are currently not doing so. And then we have first time users being people who have just tried the product once or for the first time. And then we have regular users being people who have tried the product and consistently come back to repurchase it, right? Now, it is very important for the firm to note the various consumers at these different user statuses to know how to plan their marketing regarding which of these users to target. So you will notice that whenever a company puts out particularly their marketing communications, they target a number of these users. For instance, if you watch an advert, you will notice that there is always communication about how the product can be used and what needs it satisfies, isn't it? Yes. Which of these users do you think that is targeted at? The non-users. The non-users, good. And who else? First time users, maybe. First time users as well. Good, Nanama. And potential users as well. Right? Again, the adverts will often provide information about how to contact the company. This information is also targeted at non users, potential users, and first time users. And again, in talking about how the product can be used and what benefits it satisfies, it's also targeting the ex users in case they have forgotten what benefits they were getting from the product so that they can be reminded and probably renew their interest in the purchase and use of this product or service that we are talking about. Now, moving on from user status, we can also talk about usage rate. And this is where we are talking about how often or how much the consumer uses the product. And in this regard, we can talk about three groups of consumers where we have the light users, the medium users, and the heavy product users, right? And in some cases, you will notice that heavy users are often a small slice of the market, but they account for a high percentage of total consumption. Given that even though they are not many, they tend to purchase more than the other market segments. So you will notice that marketers will often take advantage of this by providing certain products, for instance, in different sizes and packages. A typical example is toothpaste. We have the small sizes and the value sizes, which are very big, isn't it? Yeah, Good. We can also talk about beverages like Milo. That come in the tin and in the sachet. And in the sachet, we have a small size, a medium size, and a big sachet. But in the tin, we have the regular tin size, and then we have the extra large tin size. All of these are in response to the usage rate variables as they, they relate to um, the various market segments that the firm's product or service could potentially serve. Right? So that is in regard to the usage related variables as it concerns user status and usage rate. We can also talk about buyer readiness stage. At any point in time, some people may be unaware of a product. Some may be aware but have not made up their minds to purchase it. Some may be aware and also be very well informed about the product and what it does, but may not be interested. Some may be aware, they may be informed and may be interested, but they do not have any desire to go ahead and purchase. Others may have the desire and they may intend to buy it, but they may not actually engage in the, in the behavior of purchasing. Now, these are all different stages of buyer readiness that the marketer has to be cognizant of and actively work towards utilizing their marketing mix to push consumers closer towards the act of actually making the purchase. So the marketer must aim at not just getting consumers informed and interested, but they should also influence them such that they become, they have strong desires to purchase the product, sorry, and then formulate strong intentions, which could easily be translated into actual purchasing behavior for that product or service. 
firms could also segment the market on the basis of loyalty. And here we can talk about hardcore loyals versus split loyals versus shifting loyals and versus switches. Hardcore loyals are those who are stuck to one particular brand and regardless of what you say or do, will not switch. These are the best kind of customers that a marketer could hope for. However, there are also split loyals who would usually have two brand options that they alternate between. Now the aim here is for a marketer to always make sure that of these two, when there is a split, the die will always be cast in their favor, such that they will always be prepared and chosen over the alternate brand. Whereas we have the shifting loyals who do not have just one or two brands that they alternate between, but they have several, which they shift from, from time to time, depending on their moods and depending on, on their feelings or the specific circumstances that they are going through at that point in time. And finally, we can talk about the switches. They have no loyalty whatsoever to any brand and will therefore switch very easily from one brand to the next, depending on how convincing the offer is from that particular brand, right? So the aim here is for marketers to always aim at converting split loyals and shifting loyals into hardcore loyals and convince switchers to stop jumping from one place to the other and stick to one particular brand being their brand. Now, finally, we can talk about attitude. And this has to do with the consumer's attitudes or feelings about a particular product or service. Now, you will notice that when it comes to certain products and services in specific categories, consumers can be very enthusiastic about them. And for other brands, they, they, they may not be so enthusiastic. Likewise, they can have positive emotions about a particular brand and have extremely negative emotions about another to the point where some consumers become hostile when presented with certain brands of products and service. And you'll notice that for other brands, consumers could simply care less. They are simply indifferent. Now, as a marketer, it is very important for you to determine the attitude that consumers have towards your products and services. Because without knowing the attitude that they have, you will not know what effort you have to put in in order to convert them to have more positive and enthusiastic attitudes towards your brand to aid in their purchasing of your specific brand of product or service. So knowing the attitude of the consumers is important to helping the brand formulate the appropriate marketing mix strategy. So that is for user and usage related variables and brings us to the end of our discussion on behavioral segmentation. So in general, looking at this model, it gives us a snapshot of behavioral segmentation and its breakdown. Meaning that when you have a target market, generally you will have a group that is aware of your products or service and another group that is unaware. Now of the group that is aware, you will have two groups that may have tried and others that have not tried the product at all. Now, of those who have tried your brand of product or service, you would have a subset of three groups being rejected, being those who have tried and disliked the product. Those who have tried it have not necessarily rejected it, but they have also not yet repeat purchased it. And then of those who have tried, you can also have those who have tried it and have repeatedly purchased it. Now, once they begin to purchase it on a repeat basis, they could either fall into the category of those who are loyal to the brand or those who are switches, meaning that they are repeat purchasing our brand and they do not do it often because they sometimes purchase ours and, and at other times purchase those of other brands. Or they could be split loyalists where they repeat purchase but it alternates with one other brand, right? As we have learned in the previous discussion when we're talking about loyalty status. So like I mentioned, the hardcore loyalists, being those who are loyal to the brand, are the preferred group that the marketer would want to focus on, given that they would either be, in terms of their loyalty, heavy users, regular users, or light users, meaning that the firm could, in one way or another, regardless of where they fall in these three categories, still earn revenue from them, and therefore can find creative ways of pushing them to be able to get more out of them 
by, for instance, pushing light users to become more of regular or heavy users and getting regular users to become more of heavy users of the said product or sales. However, if you are dealing with a group that has not tried your product, it's either because they are indifferent or they have a negative opinion about your brand or they have a favorable opinion. For those who have a negative opinion, the firm has the agile's task of changing that opinion into a favorable one so that they can go ahead and try your product and then ultimately repeat purchasing. And for those who are indifferent, it's about convincing them to form a positive opinion as well so that they can also go ahead and try the product and ultimately become loyalists. And for those who have a favorable opinion, the task is a bit easier because then you can spend less effort getting them to actually try the product and then ultimately becoming loyal to your brand. So in a nutshell, this is a practical breakdown of behavioral segmentation from the various stages that we just discussed a few moments ago. And with that, we come to the end of the discussion on segmenting the consumer market. Now for segmenting the business market, like I mentioned, the business market has slightly different characteristics from the consumer market. So even though the variables we've just talked about in the consumer market for segmentation, including the demographics, the geographics, the psychographics, and the behavioral, we can use the same variables in the business markets as well. However, there are other variables that have to be included. If the marketer is to efficiently and effectively segment the business market based on their unique characteristics, so these variables would usually begin from the demographic variables that we talked about in the consumer market context, and then get into more of other variables like operating variables, and then trickle down to the personal characteristics of the organizational buyer, right? As shown in this table, we can see here. And these have to be done in the order that they have been presented. If the firm is to be able to come up with unique segments that they can effectively and efficiently satisfy. So like I mentioned, it begins with demographic variables in the business market, including the particular industry, company size and location. And then beyond that, the firm moves into looking at your creating variables, including the technology involved, the user or non-user status of the said business organization and the customer capabilities being the capabilities of this particular business customer. Now, beyond this, the firm moves into the purchasing approaches, meaning how to go about approaching the purchase process with this business customer, either by using the purchasing function organization or using power structure or using the nature of the existing relationship or general purchasing policies or purchasing criteria. All of these are important for the marketer to consider if they should effectively segment the business market. Now, beyond that, they need to consider situational factors, including the urgency involved, as well as the specific application of the product and the size or the order that they are going to put in for this particular business customer. And then ultimately, they need to look at personal characteristics of these business customers including the buyer-seller similarity. Because without there being some synergy in terms of the characteristics of the buyer and the seller, it may be very difficult to be able to do business with such an organization. Again, they need to consider the attitude of the business customer toward risk. Because that will, to a large extent, influence the nature of the transaction and how it is executed between the firm and the business customer. And then the final item under personal characteristics is loyalty. Because like we mentioned, loyalty is very key, especially if the business is to remain profitable into the long term. So these are the major segmentation variables or basis that marketers have to consider when it comes to dealing with business markets. And as you can see, they are significantly different from that of the segmentation variables we discussed for the consumer market, even though there are some similarities. Good.
So on that note, we come to the end of the discussion on segmentation, which is the first letter in the STP acronym. Now we move on to the next letter in the acronym, which has to do with targeting. Now to be able to target, you have to have effectively segmented the market. Now to be able to target, you have to be able to identify those market segments that you can serve effectively and efficiently. And to be able to select out of these segments, which ones you can serve effectively and efficiently, you have to be able to rate the segments that you have identified to determine which ones are favorable and which ones are not. And to be able to do this, there are five key criteria we look at. The first one is measurability. And here we need to ask ourselves the size, the purchasing power, and the characteristics of these segments. Which ones are large enough? Which ones have the purchasing power? Because it's not enough for a market to be large. If the market is large and they do not have purchasing power, it is defeatist for you as a firm to target them with your marketing efforts because you will not be able to get the revenue to match the cost that you will incur in marketing to that customer segment. So the size of the market must be considered in conjunction with their purchasing power and the characteristics of the market in how best suited they are for the product or service that you are offering for sale. Again, the market has to be substantial enough substantial in terms of the size and profitability. Because you would not want to expend your marketing efforts targeting a market that is not substantial enough to give you your revenue targets. And again, they have to be profitable enough, which takes us back to the purchasing part, such that you can be able to sell your product and make a bit of a margin on top of the cost incurred in manufacturing and producing the product so that the firm can be able to earn enough revenue to remain profitable. Now, aside from being substantial, the market segment also has to be accessible. It's not enough for the market to be measurable in terms of being sizable and having the purchasing power or being substantial enough for you to remain profitable in serving them. You also have to be able to access the market with your product or service. And this involves being able to reach and serve them effectively. Edwin, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Can you hear me, please? Yes, please. So, so I, I want to understand that we are now talking about targeting, which is a key, right? I haven't gone directly into targeting. I'm leading you into targeting. Okay, okay. Yes. That, that, but, that, that's okay, because I'm realizing I'm realizing that um, um, just so that I don't get confused, the term targeting and are being used is that change. Yes, I'm leading you to the uh, 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 I just wanted to be sure whether we are into targeting and why perhaps we are referring to section two. Yes, that is clear. good. I'm leading you into targeting in the sense that before we can target, you have to be able to identify how to rate the segment to know which one to target. Erin, are you with me? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm good. With you. So I'm talking about the rating before I go into the targeting. So we are well, still well, somewhat well. in segmentation. Yes. Okay. Right. So, like I said, the market has to be measurable and substantial as well as accessible. So you can be able to reach them and serve them with your offer. And they should also be differentiable, right? Such that they are conceptually distinguishable and will respond to the different marketing mix programs that you use. Because if you cannot be able to target them with a specific and uniquely designed marketing mix program, it will be very difficult for you to get their attention and pry them away from the competition. So they have to be differentiable. And ultimately they have to be actionable such that you have the necessary marketing tools and resources to be able to design and formulate an effective marketing program to attract and serve these segments. So once you have been able to identify the different segments, you have to rate them on each of these criteria. 
being measurability, substantiability, accessibility, differentiability, and actionability. And then select out of them the markets that rate highly on these criteria. And those are the ones that you are going to target. So when we talk about targeting, it's about the evaluation of the potential and commercial attractiveness using the criteria I just talked about, the five criteria. Because by the time you finish going through this, you would have been able to clearly evaluate the potential of each market segment and how attractive they are commercially to be able to know which ones you want to go after and which ones you want to ignore. So once you identify the segments you want to serve, it means that you have seen some unique opportunities in them that you believe you are poised as an organization to be able to serve, right? And to be able to effectively do this, you have to make sure that you have gone through the five stages that we talked about in terms of evaluation criteria to know which markets you want to target. Now here, it's important to note that using the different segmentation variables we have discussed, you can divide the market into whichever size or structure or segment you want. And sometimes you would notice that in an effort to identify smaller groups, some firms would, like I mentioned earlier in our discussion, combine various segmentation variables including, for instance, they will use demographic along with behavioral and psychographic just to make sure that they can be able to identify a unique niche within the market that they can serve and serve profitably. All this goes to emphasize the fact that targeting is very important. And without targeting, the firm will be wasting a lot of resources seven segments that will not necessarily yield the profitability that they are looking for and will not help them to be able to achieve their set objectives for pursuing these marketing programs in the first place. So in evaluating and selecting market segments, like I said, using the criteria we identified, the firm has to be concerned with looking at the size of the segments and their growth because it is not enough to target a market that looks attractive in the short term, that looks actionable or measurable or substantial in the short term. You also need to consider the long term. Will this market remain substantial into the foreseeable future? Will this market remain actionable into the foreseeable future? If not, it will not make sense for the firm to expend significant resources targeting such a market segment in the short term because the benefits will be short-lived and that will not help the firm to remain profitable into the long term. Again, in terms of the structural attractiveness, if the structure of the market is not one that is attractive enough and will remain attractive into the foreseeable future, it is not worth pursuing for the firm because the firm would want to make revenue benefits from whatever investments they are making in that market segment currently into the long term. And in targeting these market segments, like I have been saying repeatedly since we started the lecture, it's all about the firm's objectives and their resource endowments. So if a particular market segment is not in line with the firm's objectives and it's not poised such that the, with the firm's current resource endowments, they can effectively serve them, they are not worth pursuing as a target market. And most importantly, the firm must consider the competitive advantages within such markets. Because if you do not have any competitive advantage in a particular market segment, and there is intense competition, for some firms, given their resource endowments, it will not make sense to pursue such a market segment given that they may be out-competed and perhaps kicked out of the market. Or they may end up losing significant amounts of resources which they may not be able to recover in the long term. So it's important that the firm consider these issues when they are evaluating and selecting the market segments that they want to target, given the segmentation criteria we talked about earlier. So with that understanding, 
There's another criteria that the firm can use when it comes to targeting. Aside looking at the markets based on size and growth, structural attractiveness, their objectives and resources, as well as competitive advantage, they can also look at it in terms of a range of continuum of possible levels of segmentation, which they want to target. Starting from the extreme left on the model we can see on our screen, which looks at mass market segmentation, where the firm considers full market coverage as their target. So here, if it's full market coverage, it means the firm decides to target and market to the whole market where they are attempting to serve all the different customer groups in the marketplace without picking and choosing out of the lot. Now for firms who do not believe this is plausible, they can move along the continuum to the next level, which looks at targeting multiple segments. So here the firm may choose not to serve the full market, but may choose one or two or three segments that they believe are most attractive and offer them the appropriate opportunities and will enable them to make the profits that they are looking for through the process of multiple segment specialization. Now for those firms for whom multiple segment specialization is not an option, sorry, they can look into satisfying single segments where they pick one segment, focus on it, learn all they can about this particular market segment and concentrate all their efforts into designing marketing mix programs to profitably meet the needs of customers within this particular market segment through single segment concentration. Now beyond single segment concentration, the firm could utilize the strategy of individuals as segments where they have reached the extreme on the continuum, which looks at customization. So here it's more about utilizing one-to-one -one or customized marketing where they interact with individual customers and customize their marketing offering to suit the needs of each and every one of these individual customers. So here it's not about mass marketing where they design a product on mass for the whole market or for specific market segments with few variations. Here it's about customization where every single product or service is customized to the unique needs of single customers. So the firm needs to look at this continuum and decide based on their objectives and resource endowments, which points along this continuum they can effectively operate at when it comes to their marketing and target the specific segments that they believe they can effectively and efficiently serve in order to satisfy their objectives as a firm within their resource endowments. Okay, so Edwin has a question. He says, so please, does the full market consist of both aware and the unaware segments, or is this just the aware target that make up the full market? The full market consists of both those who are aware and unaware. So the firm is expending significant resources in trying to reach all these diverse groups, both those who are unaware aware and those who are unaware, to be able to ensure that they can reach them with their market offering. Now, I forgot to mention that the further you move along the continuum, the more expensive the process becomes because you will realize that it is easier to target the mass market with a mass product than to customize the suit specific and individual needs of, of individual customers. True or false? Very true. Good, right? So some firms would usually stay on the mass side of the continuum and avoid going through the hassle of customization and specifically targeting individual customers, right? Great, Edwin. I'm glad your question is answered. Yes, it will be very expensive to, no, not necessarily. You see, um, Edwin, are you talking about the mass marketing or the customization? Which one are you saying will be very expensive? Huh? 
Customization, yes. Customization is very expensive. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So that is for the targeting. So you would realize that those who customize are usually the niche marketers, isn't it? From our previous lecture last week, you notice that the niche marketers are those who usually do the customization. Good. And they are the ones who would usually charge a premium. Sure. And that is what largely contributes to the expensive nature of, of the service. Yes. Thank you, Edwin. Grace, did someone mention, mention my name right now? Richard, um, can you clarify? You said long-term SLA. Please clarify. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so for customization, uh, most companies like to sign a long term service level agreement. Good. So if you want to customize, then you need to be with us for the next X years. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much, Richard. Very excellent point. Right. So that is for targeting. So once you target and you know the segments you are serving, it's now about positioning yourself. And I'm very happy with the example Richard just gave because some of these service level agreements are some of the tactics that firms use to position themselves. Because once you sign these service level agreements, it's like you have hooked the customer on to your product for a certain period of time. So you have positioned yourself against other competitors such that they cannot go to other competitors and patronize from them as long as this long-term service level agreement exists. So when we talk about positioning, it's basically the act of designing your offering and image to occupy a distinctive place in the mind of your target market. So here, the result of doing this positioning we are talking about is basically creating a unique reason why your customer must always choose your brand of product or service over what your competitor is offering. And yet the example gave, Richard gave is more of a compelling reason to choose your brand over that of your competitor, especially because it has been put into writing and everyone has agreed to it, right? However, aside these agreements, it's also about the firm crafting their marketing program such that they create and communicate and deliver a unique value proposition, which would ensure that the customer is aware of the unique benefits that they are going to receive and they are guaranteed that these benefits will be delivered in the manner that they have been promised in order to provide value to them as customers by satisfying their needs and also in turn provide value to the firm in the form of revenue so when we talk about the value proposition it's about the benefits that the firm is promising that they are going to provide to the customer to satisfy whatever need that they may have. And you will notice that for several firms, their value propositions are either explicitly communicated or implied through their marketing communications. And here we can see a few examples of value propositions that are put out by firms, including Hertz, Volvo, and Dominus. Now, these are multinational firms that deal in various services and products. So for Volvo, for instance, their product is a vehicle and their value proposition is being the safest, most durable car in which the family can ride. And they have been able to communicate and deliver this value proposition over the years such that the name Volvo has become synonymous with the word safety. True or false? Good, right? So whenever you mention safety and you're talking about cars or vehicles, Volvo's name will almost always automatically come up first, right? The same goes for the other products that are in, in, the, in the table, including Domino's Pizza, and they have a reputation of delivering hot pizzas promptly, right? And they have been able to sell this value proposition, not just in the United States where they originated, but in other countries as well, like India, where they are doing excellently well all over the country, right? 
So these are examples of value propositions that the firms who crafted these value propositions have been able to communicate and deliver to their customers such that they hold a unique position in the minds of their customers. So how does a firm craft a positioning strategy? It involves three main steps. The first step is to be able to identify possi possible competitive advantages. Now, the positioning strategy begins with the identification of possible competitive advantages because, like we just mentioned, it's about being able to communicate some value that you offer to your customers or some benefits that you give them that your competitors cannot give them. And this usually comes up through the competitive advantages that you as a brand have over your competition. And these must be clearly identified and communicated to the customer. So beyond identifying the possible competitive advantages, the firm must be able to select which ones will be able to trigger the reaction that they are looking for from their customers in terms of positioning them positively in the minds of the customer. And once they have been able to select this, they must be able to communicate and effectively deliver this positioning to the customers. So in identifying the competitive advantages, they can do so in four main areas. The first one could be in the area of product differentiation, where they have an advantage over their competitors in terms of how their product is designed. Sometimes in the area of the product features or the product performance or the style and design of the product or certain attributes that the product possesses. And we see this product differentiation in several categories, particularly in the automobile industry and in the telecommunication industry, for instance, when it comes to laptops and cell phones. So in terms of performance, when we talk about the automobile industry, there are some names that will almost always be synonymous with performance. What automobile manufacturers' names are synonymous with performance? Examples of automobile manufacturers whose names are synonymous with performance. PMW, excellent, right? Others will also argue for Mercedes-Benz, right? Hey, who said Toyota? <laughs> Please, do you want them to come and jump on us this afternoon? No, no, Toyota. We are your Toyota people, we are being humble, we don't want trouble. <laughs> because if they say BMW and, and Land Rover, hey, can we Toyota people also speak up? Please, Toyota drivers in the house. Can, can we put ourselves in the same category as the Mercedes and the BMWs when it comes to performance? I don't think so. Edwin, yes, for reliability, I would always put Toyota up. Toyota is a very reliable car, especially for our climate and context. Right? So for reliability, yes. But for performance, hmm, I don't think we can hold a candle to the BMWs and the mercedes Benz. Good. So that's for product differentiation. Next, we can talk about services differentiation, where the firm will distinguish themselves in terms of how they deliver their services, including the installation, if it is a physical product that needs to be installed, if it's an actual service that is delivered, it's about how the service scape is designed and how the overall service delivery process takes place. If it's a physical product, how customer training services are offered to help customers get the best value out of their products and services, as well as repair services that are offered in addition to the sale of a product to ensure that when the customer has a challenge, they will be able to go and get it repaired, right? Other firms would also distinguish themselves by way of competitive advantage based on image. So they would use specific symbols and events and atmospheres to communicate a particular image, which will help them stand out or set them apart from their competition. For other firms, it's all about the personnel that they have. And this is largely identified by the way in which they go about hiring their personnel, how they train their personnel, 
as compared with how their competition trains their personnel. So you go to certain organizations and you realize that the level of aptitude and professionalism with which the employees deliver services will be significantly different from how other firms would have their employees delivering service. Largely due to how the particular firm goes about hiring and training their employees to discharge their duties. So when it comes to selecting a competitive advantage to communicate and deliver to the customer, to be able to position yourself as a preferred brand in the mind and the heart of the customer, these are the four main areas in which the firm can go about differentiating themselves in order to establish this competitive advantage that we are talking about. And once this has been done, the firm has to use all their marketing mix programs to communicate this competitive advantage and deliver it appropriately to the customer. So when we talk about performance and names like BMW and Benz come up, it is because the entire marketing mix program is designed to communicate this, right from how the product is designed, to the parts that are used in the product, to how the product is priced, to the manner in which the product is promoted, the kind of imagery that they create around the product, and to how the product is delivered to the final consumer. All of these communicate the air of performance around the brand, which has become the unique position that it occupies in the minds of we, the consumers. Now, when it comes to communicating and delivering a chosen position, it is very important for the firm to identify that consumer needs and wants evolve over time. And so do competitive strategies. So whatever may constitute a competitive advantage today may tomorrow, depending on the growth and expansion of your competitor, become an obsolete source of competitive advantage. Likewise, what may give you a unique position in the mind of your consumer may tomorrow be obsolete, given that depending on the nature of your competitive strategies, they may be offering that and more to the consumer. In that regard, Positioning strategies must be closely monitored by implementing firms and adapted over time. Because if the firm does not monitor and adapt their strategy, as the consumer needs and wants continue to evolve and they become more sophisticated in terms of their tastes and preferences, and your competitors are evolving to meet these consumers and their changing tastes and preferences at their point of need, it will become very difficult for you to maintain that competitive advantage that you have which has led to you occupying that unique position in the mind of your consumer. Hence, it is very important for you as a brand and as a marketer to consistently monitor your position over time and keep adapting your strategy to ensure that you maintain this unique position that you occupy, even as consumer needs and wants evolve and your competitive strategies also evolve. And with that, We've come to the end of our session for today. If anyone have any question they want to ask or anything they need clarification on before we call it a day. Yes, Priscilla. Okay, Doc. Um, please, mine is not a question, but maybe an add-on. Please so, go ahead. Um, so these days, uh, most brands, instead of doing the value proposition they are moving more into the emotive proposition okay so instead of talking about their product offering what their product does for people mm -hmm. they rather want to touch on the tension points in people's lives and how the brand can meet it okay. so for example a brand like nike you see their proposition as just do it yeah and then someone yeah. ask him or herself that how is just do it related to Nike producing shoes or bags or something like that. Yeah. And it's like they want to meet people at their emotional points of need that mm -hmm. whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you are this, whether you are trying to ride a bicycle for the first time or what, be courageous and just do it. Mm -hmm. So now most brands are playing in the emotional um. Um, bits the segment but not really the the product offering side so when you come to Ghana like this um, a brand like let's say Tasty Tom 
So their proposition is no more in terms of product. They are no more saying that buy a juicy, tasty tomato paste, but rather they are saying strength comes from within. Yeah. And that is because they are trying to target the women who fall within their target audience, that these are women who are trying to do well and all that. Another yeah. example is, um, is Fritol. So usually, I mean, initially their whole campaign message was naturally cholesterol free. Yeah. Now they moved into an emotive proposition where they say every woman deserves to be well. Yeah. So now yeah. instead of um, delivering a product that is naturally cholesterol free. Now they are touching you at your, your tension point that no matter how you, much you are struggling, the brand is a shoulder for you to lean on. So sometimes you may not be able to directly connote the proposition to the product itself because- Yeah, but Prisma, would you agree that what you are talking about is also the value proposition okay it is a value i'm talking about you see in the past most of these propositions and um, just at the first glance you are able to tell which products they are offering you good but these days so they are still using the value look, proposition right Priscilla? but like you are saying it's, it's still, uh -huh. based on what we just discussed they are they are evolving isn't it Exactly. Yeah. So Both you still the see the value needs. proposition in there. Great. Definitely, there's Great. no way you can take the products. At the end of the day, that Good. is what brings the revenue. Yes. But these are just another layer. People are trying to enter, and um, most brands are trying to enter. So just in case maybe yeah. we see, <laughs> you just want, what do they sell? Yeah. The same night, but they yeah. are trying to communicate something else. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right, so excellent submission, Priscilla. And you will notice that this just do it has been there since Nike's inception. Yes. Yes, yeah. but the local firms in Ghana are just catching on, isn't it? Yeah. So you can see the differences in terms of evolution and the forward thinking. Yeah. <laughs> People are now picking it up. People are now yeah. picking up with others. Right, but excellent submission, Priscilla. Very, very, very good.